And hi, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. First of all, I hope you're all keeping well. And second, uh, I do want to apologize for the fact that we were not able to broadcast this live due to some technical issues. I believe that our server was down, so unfortunately, we were not able to, um, to go live, but we are recording it. <clears throat> so today's presentation relates to light and color and how these two elements interact with each other. Uh, this presentation is part of a course program that we run in Atlanta, Georgia, and usually lasts about two days. But due to time restrictions, we are going to condense this presentation in an hour and still hope to make it effective. So starting off with the first question, well, what, what, is, what is color? Well, color itself does not exist. Oh, yeah. Color basically exists only in presence of light. And if we do take this photo, I take a look at this photo that was taken in complete absence of light, we can barely see the color of the image. But if we take the same photo in presence of light, color reveals itself. And this question has been asked by many since centuries. And if we take a look in the past, Empedocles believed that we could see light because light came through our eyes. And Alhazen, who was an Egyptian scientist, discovered that objects reflected light. And Euclid, mathematician, discovers that light travels in a state line. And Aristotle, a Greek philosopher, believes that objects contained color and that existed even in absence of light. The great René Descartes, French philosopher and scientist in the late 1500 believes that colors appeared when light touched objects. And he was the one that started to unravel the mysteries of light and color. And when he lets light pass through a prism, and projects it on a wall at a very close distance, notices that two colors appear. But the great change comes with Isaac Newton in 1660. Newton was obsessed in why he could not see color in absence of light. And this took him about two years to find the answer. And all his work was published in a book called Optica. Following Descartes' footprints, Newton discovers that by letting light pass through a prism and projecting it on a wall at a further, a further distance, around about six meet, meters, produce an elongated shape of many colors, but still in doubt if the color was within the light or did it actually come out from the prism. He performs his experimentum crucis and defines the exact relation between light and color. By integrating a second prism, he lets only one beam of light from that spectrum shine and project it on another wall. And he notices that the angle of refraction of both the first and second light are basically the same, confirming that color is in light. These are Newton's theories and uh, light can be dispersed in various colors or light is the result of objects interacting with already colored light rather than objects generating color themselves. And regardless of whether light is reflected, scattered or transmitted, it remains the same color. So in reality, how do we perceive color through light? Well, this is the electromagnetic spectrum. And the only part that we can see of the spectrum is the very small part known as the color spectrum. And we do need to know that light travels in waves and at a speed of around about 300,000 kilometers per second. And these waves are constantly bouncing off objects around us. And each color wave has a different wavelength. 
And when these light waves enter our eyes, they are captured by proprioceptors known as rods and cones. Each cone is sensible to a specific wavelength that will react to the red, green, and blue light wave. This information is then sent to the brain and elaborated in order for us to recognize the actual color. So, for example, when light strikes an apple, the green, the blue light waves are absorbed and the apple and is reflected only the red light wave that solicitates our red cone and our brain will tell us that the apple is red. Now, bringing this example to the first image that we have, it's interesting to understand how, <clears throat> how colors actually absorb and, and reflect light. They don't do it all in the same, in the same way. So looking at the, the reflection of, of, of color in relation to the image that we have, the reds of the bricks and uh, the doors and the windows will perform similar to, to the apple. But looking at the roof, when light strikes this dark color, absolutely no light wave is reflected. Everything is completely absorbed and it basically reflects the darkness, which we know as black. But when light strikes the white garage door, it behaves exactly in a different way or in the opposite way. Here, all the light waves are reflected. None of them are absolutely absorbed by, by the white color and what reflects is the white light. Another very important phenomenon that we do need to evaluate is how light behaves when it strikes different objects. So if light strikes a solid object, it tends to reflect light. If it strikes a transparent object, it tends to be transmitted. And if it strikes a translucent object, it tends to be absorbed. So if we take a look at this image, an everyday image that is around us, the wall that surrounds this window is an example of how light is reflected. So when light strikes that part of the wall, it basically bounces back to us, therefore reflected. The light that passes through a transparent object such as the glass, such as this window, goes basically right through it, therefore is transmitted. But when light counters objects that is not solid nor transparent, and has the ability to penetrate the object, it basically slows down the speed and disperses or scatters throughout the object itself until it exits the other side where it gains speed again and carries its journey until it strikes another object. This is said that light is absorbed, scattered, or dispersed. And it's one of the most important phenomena that we deal with every single day. And I would like to show a small <laughs> demonstration in relation to how we can perceive this relation uh, of, of color action, of light action. If I have three glasses filled with water, I am simulating a situation of light transmission. Light strikes the object and goes right through it. And I see basically what is on the background. It's emptiness. It's dark because the background is dark. If I tend to opacify these glasses of water with a simple little drop of milk, I will change the condition to, uh, to light absorption. At this point, when light strikes this object, it slows down its speed. It gets through to the background. What reflects is completely different to what I see in the middle glass. Now, I also want to take uh, this example as a situation that we often uh, find ourselves in when, when trying to integrate a single crown between two natural teeth. And this helps us understand how light reacts and gives us the opportunity to choose the ideal material. So by adding another bit of opacifier to these glasses, 
I can imagine that these are two natural teeth and I need to integrate a crown within the middle. So if the crown and the material I choose to create this crown is too uh, translucent, I am going to get the reflection of everything that is in the background. And this is certainly something that we don't want. If the opacity of this material is not equal to the natural teeth, and it's actually more translucent, I will have um, a dark, uh, a dark effect known as a low, a low value. The goal is to choose and to select materials that absorb and reflect exactly the same quantity of light as a natural tooth. And if the materials that we are using are more opacious, if or, or able to start uh, reflecting light rather than absorbing it. Uh, absolutely, it's difficult to integrate them between between two natural teeth. This is when we get that typical effect that it's known as as the glow effect. So, it is really very important that we understand how color, how light interacts with our with our objects. And if I try and modify all this by adding color, it absolutely will not integrate because it's not an issue of color, but it is an issue of how light is transmitted through the objects. Now, I have just added some color to the left glass. And if I have an equivalent on the right side, I can add as much color as I like, and I'll always be able to match it. But if I try and add color to the more opacious material, I will just carry on um, not being able to integrate within the contest. So this little experiment just puts me in a condition where it helps me choose uh, the type of material that I that I need to use. And um, choosing the material that absorbs the right quantity of light is absolutely um, what we need to look for when um, in trying to integrate um, a, uh, a tooth between two, between two natural teeth. And what I do want to say here is that we, ne we need a great merit. We need to give a great merit to, to a great dental technician, Mr. Enrique Stega, that spent most of his life at the bench dealing with these issues, just like, just like all of us. And that today finds himself on the other side of the barricade where he constantly is working to find the best material to solve one of the major problems that we deal with every day. So thanks, Mr. Steger, for your contribution in, in helping us with these, uh, with these issues. Another phenomenon that we do need to keep in consideration is the specular diffusion, is the, the specular and the diffused reflection of light when it does strike an object. Now, when light strikes a flat or perfect flat smooth surface, the angle of reflection is the same as the angle of incidence. And when light strikes a rough surface, the reflection diffused in all directions. This evaluation is really very important when it comes to the surface of our teeth. An accurate analysis needs to be performed in order to match existing surface textures of, of natural teeth. Let's speak a little bit about color theory. This is another element very interesting to keep in consideration. Well, color theory is a term used to describe rules and guidelines regarding the use of color in art and design. And they are basically three categories that we do need to keep in consideration. The color wheel, the color harmony, and how colors are used. So let's get back to our old friend, Mr. Isaac Newton, that developed the first circular diagram of color based on the visible light and is the foundation of the Roy G. Biff system, basically the colors of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, where the red, yellow, and blue are our primary colors. And since then, scientists and artists have studied and designed numerous variations of this concept until we get towards the 20th century, where English and um, 
German color scientists recognize that the ideal primary colors are the ones that we actually perceive by means of our sensors, therefore the red, the blue, and the green light waves that are obtained through the additive mixture of three monochromatic lights, all mixed together, lead to perfect white light. So this is known as the additive color system or the RGB uh, color system. And that in our world today is a color reference for anything that relates to light, such as computers, projectors, and, uh, and TVs. And it's from these primaries that mixing them together, we will get a secondary. So mixing red and green together, we will get yellow. And mixing blue and green together, we'll get what is Chiang and uh, <clears throat> mixing blue and red together, we will get what is known as magenta. All these colors mixed together lead us to white. And it's from this additive color system that the artist color theory was adapted to primary colors that react better with ink dyes and pigments and defining these primaries as substances that absorb only one retinal primary color. Basically, by subtracting our red, we are left with blue and green that mixed together produce Chiang. Chiang becomes a primary in the subtractive system. If we eliminate the blue, we are left with the green and the red that mix together form a primary of the subtractive. The yellow becomes a primary of the subtractive system. And here again, if we eliminate yellow, we are left with red and blue that mix together form magenta. And this becomes this, the third color of the subtractive system, also known as the CMY color system. And that references to anything that relates to color pigments, inks, and dyes. In the printing world, black is usually added to the CMY system, forming the CMYK, where K stands for black. The secondary colors are formed by mixing the two primaries together, where we get the orange. Mixing the Chiang and the magenta, we'll get the violet or the purple, and mixing the yellow and the Chiang, we obtain the secondary. And the tetraries is by mixing a primary color with a secondary color. And we will get the yellow orange, the red orange, the red violet, the blue violet, the blue green, and the yellow green. Albert Mansell contributes in amplifying the Roy G. Biff system and adds three dimensions to color. The three dimensions are the hue, chroma, and, uh, and value. So the hue relates to the actual denomination of the color itself, red, yellow, green, orange, triangle, blue, and so on and so forth. Chroma relates to how pure or saturated the color is. And the value relates to how dark or how light the color is in relation to a grayscale that goes from black to white. Color harmony. Color harmony 
basically refers to the property that certain colors have when combined together. And that are aesthetically pleasing. And in harmony with each other. The colors are usually arranged in schemes. So we have the complementary color scheme where it relates to color opposites. So the yellow is a complementary of purple. The red orange is a complementary of the blue green and so on and so forth. And usually the complementaries are used to lower to lower the value. The second scheme is known to be the analogous scheme uh, where these colors are used next to each other. They usually match very well and create and create a serene and comfortable harmonies uh, in their layout. The split complementaries are very similar to the complementaries. Uh, it's a combination of an analogous and a complementary scheme, and this gives us more variety and visual interest. And remember, they can be placed in any area of the wheel. The important is that they follow the same distance. The triadic system is used uh, are colors that are eventually spaced around the, the wheel, and uh, they create harmonies that tend to be more vibrant. The tetradic system is a color scheme used with four colors arranged into complementary pairs. And here we have plenty possibilities of variations. And the last scheme is the square scheme, which is very similar to the rectangle, but with four colors spaced evenly around, around the color circle. what relates to warm and, uh, and cool colors. So by dividing the color wheel in half, in the zone of the red, purple, and the green, yellow, we can actually distinguish the warm colors from the cool colors and are used in specific expressions um, that we usually use when describing specific situations, like often happens we need to warm or to cool down the color that we are actually utilizing. Now, I'm going to try and activate this scheme that relates to, to color mixing. Uh, it's a sort of an experiment, but we need to go to... No, no. That one there. Okay, let's see if it works. So, just to get an idea, usually during the practical course, we get to a point where we start <coughs> taking to 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 the bench all these elements and putting them together, and we start what is what is actually color mixing. But we don't have that opportunity today. So, by utilizing these um, these spectrums, we can actually notice. You guys pay attention of what's happening in the actual circle with these colors. And we have the opportunity to modify the hues and the chromas and the values of colors in relation to the necessity of what we're actually looking for. So this is a representation of a fully saturated red, where it's a color that I'm going to use pretty often when I'm dealing with my with my tissues. And if I just use one color, I'll be using a monochromatic color. And <clears throat> it'll be uh, pretty, uh, pretty flat. So we do need to create some contrast. And if we have a fully saturated color, we can move within the spectrum or move within the colors that we have, bring it towards the orange or bring it towards the violet. So it, we also have the opportunity to lighten this color, therefore change the saturation and change and have different hues in relation to the color that we are that we are working with. And I can also desaturate the color by adding some translucent or some transparent materials 
to the mass and obtain different type of things that I can actually uh, relate to. But when I need some great contrast, what I do do is use a complementary color and create different values of, uh, of the color itself. So we can actually generate with one simple primary color hundreds of, of, of variations to the color itself. And this is what we usually do during our, our courses. We, we learn how to mix these colors in order to, to create all these variations. I'm going to keep it here. I hope that this just gave you an idea. But um, certainly in a practical course, we get involved and we spend quite a bit of time in learning how to, how to mix all these colors <clears throat> in order to get the display that we actually, actually need. So now we have um, uh, we have a good idea of what relates to uh, to color theory. We should move forward and have a good understanding of of um, the materials that we have to our disposal in relation to uh, to what we actually need. We need to perform so color liquids. These color liquids are liquids by means of which we customize the colorings of monochromatic pre-scented zirconia by infiltration. And there are basically two, two categories. There is a NACID-based category with the advantage of being able to penetrate uh, the pre-scented uh, zirconia completely. Um, the disadvantage is the fact that it is an acid. It does disperse in the atmosphere. So we need to treat it in a specific way in order to not create any uh, unwanted um, uh, situations in, in, in our laboratories. Uh, the water base is a little bit easier to, to treat and to work with. Um, it's, it doesn't penetrate as much as, uh, as the acid. It goes in around about three tenths of a millimeter. Uh, the color effects are certainly amazing, uh, but one of the major issues could be if there's only touchings to be done on the occlusal surface. Uh, not being well infiltrated, we can encounter the risk that uh, these little white dots block up onto the crown and makes it really very, very difficult to, um, to eliminate. So each family of zirconia with its specific characteristics call for the correspondent family of, of color liquids and the array of colors correspond to the Vita shade guide with multiple options of modifications. These are all the vibrant colors that we have to modify our, our zirconia materials from the blues to the violets, to the browns, the oranges, the grays, and three, and three tissue colors. Um, our ceramic materials or the ceramic materials that we have to, to our disposal, there are three complete kits of ceramics. Uh, the basic kit has all the Vita shades of the dentin and the enamel masses, certainly with an excellent absorption in combination with, uh, with the zirconia material. There is a dynamic kit uh, that has uh, saturated masses uh, and kits that relate to dentine opaques, which unfortunately I don't have a photo of that, but that helps us to control to control light. Moving forward to our stains and glazes. Stains are color pigments mainly used to create effects. And uh, the kit to our disposal is a 3D stain. They have some porcelain mixed into them to improve this light transmission. And the gamut comprises all the primaries and secondaries with plenty of options of modification. And certainly the zirconia that is to our disposal. So we have zirconia materials with different characteristics in relation to light absorption and that integrates to specific solutions or situations. The ice zirconia is ideal for creating substructures that require complete layerings. It's about 1,400 MPAs in strength, therefore can be used for full arches as well as single copings. The great characteristic of this material is that it absorbs the ideal quantity of light within a thickness of five to seven tenths of a millimeter. And this is a great example of how this material works 
and how it, it relates to light. The pretal zirconia is born for full arch monolithic restorations, mainly in implant dentistry, 1,200 MPAs in strength. It's a great combination between strength and translucency. I believe that it works best with um, a very light layering of enamel porcelain, two to three tenths of a millimeter, especially on the buccal surface. And it is sufficient um, in the anterior region to improve its characteristics of light absorption. And the pre to dispersive is a multi-layered material with a color faded in effect between the layers. It's about 1,100 MPAs in strength, therefore ideal for any type of restoration from single crowns to full arch bridges. And the main characteristic of this material is that it absorbs light very similar to a natural tooth therefore ideal to blend within the oral cavity. This is a material absolutely to, to go for. Pretile for interior is a very high translucent material with about 670 MPAs in strength, ideal for single crowns and small bridges, but mainly for non-prepped veneers where we would like the natural tooth colors to blend through it. We can create very thin shells that are supported by the tooth structure in order to get the best aesthetics. And let's just put together all these elements and um, move through a coloring technique. So what I do actually see here is is a canvas, a canvas that we need to infiltrate, that we need to color. And my first objective is to create a background. I have no expectations that my color liquids um, create the details that I actually need, but I do expect that they create the foundation over which we are going to then enhance these colors. So by modifying, by elaborating, by mixing, and by creating different hues and different values in relation to the dominating dentin, uh, we will infiltrate these elements. Now, the technique themselves is related to how we are going to brush them on. I don't um, agree on, on, on the dipping technique. I do prefer creating a transition of colors um, like, like it actually really is during in, in, in a natural tooth. So by desaturating um, the primary color liquid, I will obtain different layers and different intensities and different transitions of the color throughout the tooth by adding um, intense colors like orange that is um, on the root area of the tooth and start enhancing our values with, uh, with the dynamic effects of, of, the, of the enamels. Now, just remember that all these colors can be modified. We do have uh, the actual intensity or the, the hue of, of the color in relation to blue, but we also have liquids or carriers that give us the opportunity to dilute these colors and create an infinity array of, 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 of enamel colors that we, can, that we can use. And this is all done during the practical course. So we get a really good understanding how we perform anything. So contrast between blue, um, gray, and violet is what we relate <laughs> to in relation to obtaining uh, the value and certainly the enamel effect on, on the tooth itself. So now remember, this is just a basic infiltration. It's our background. And this background now is then enhanced. Once this element gets baked, we will finish off whatever we need to do by enhancing uh, these colors with our stains and glazes. And as you take a look at this tooth, you can see <clears throat> the, the, the combination of all the elements that we spoke to about today. We have the actual hue, the dominating dentine. We have an elaboration on that hue where we desaturated it in certain areas and we saturated it in others. We have a contrast with the, with the values. 
uh, and uh, and certainly um, the harmony between the colors and the integration of these colors um, on on this specific tooth so this is the goal and the objective of our courses is to understand and how to apply all these all these colors i'm going to conclude with this photo which i believe reflects the absolute perfect um, situation in our in our everyday job this four veneers are the representation of the final goals the choice of the ideal material that reflects and reacts uh, perfectly with with the natural dentitions which are which are the lower teeth the in the contrast with the values and the contrast with the translucent materials uh, with the translucency that that we are usually looking for so this is a pre tau two and um, i really do believe that this is one of the materials that we need to really keep in in consideration so concluding by i don't believe that we have any any hidden tricks or secrets but i do believe that with constant work and perseverance and a little help from friends we can all reach exceptional levels whatever we spoke about today is science and it is ha and it has been proven the only thing we need to do is understand how light behaves within the materials that we use how much light is the material able to absorb and how much is it reflects or diffuses from the surface acquire as much knowledge as possible in relation to color theory and understand the three dimensions of color hue chroma and value and how to modify these dimensions in, <clears throat> to our advantage practice color mixing to obtain color harmonies and have a color wheel uh, or a color chart to our disposal it's certainly a great help especially in the beginning have the opportunity to compare our work directly in the mouth helps us understand all these elements and remember that practice makes perfect so practice practice and practice thank you all very very much